Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. So my object in making this video is to give you a complete playthrough of an upfront scenario from start to finish. And I've decided for this particular exercise that I'm going to pit the British against the Japanese in the spring of 1942. So the inspiration I've taken for this is that as it's the 80th anniversary really of uh, um, spring 42, um, I looked at what was going on in the <clears throat> East Asian theatre at this time. And on March the 8th, um, following a string of successes against Allied arms, including humiliatingly for the British, the loss of Malaya and Singapore, the Japanese had been driving very successfully into Burma. Uh, Rangoon, the capital, had surrendered on March the 8th. And although the British army had managed to withdraw, it was a near run thing and they were being hotly pursued by Japanese forces. So between March 8th, the fall of Rangoon and um, the following month, where the British were able to make some sort of a temporary stand around the oil fields of Yenangyong, there was a confused situation where British units in various stages of coherence were gradually retreating northwards, um, trying to get back to their parent formation. Some were just trying to um, try and slow the Japanese advance. There was an awful lot of confusion and bewilderment. Uh, meanwhile, the Japanese, who were experiencing supply problems, but were, were nonetheless forging ahead because they, they were driven on by the need to keep the pressure on the British and prevent them from escaping, and also to try and secure Burma as rapidly as possible before the Allies could consolidate, were, were driving on in the face of mounting exhaustion and logistical problems. So it's an, it's an interesting um, backdrop because in a sense, both armies are in a tricky position. Now, the Japanese owed a lot of their successes to their extremely good mobility, their ability to hook around the rear of Allied units and cut their supply lines and force them to surrender. So in crafting this scenario, I was thinking, what if a force that, say, was one of the last to get out of Rangoon was trying to make its way northwards and it runs into a blocking force thrown out by, say, the Japanese 33rd Division. So in effect, we have a British squad with an armoured unit attached temporarily. They've probably just been thrown together in the chaos of the retreat. They're trying to make their way to central Burma. Uh, in keeping with the way the British Army operated at the time, they're very much road bound. If they're part of a larger column of military personnel and refugees, they probably have a large number of foot traffic uh, with them, uh, as well as a couple of lorries, perhaps bearing supplies, wounded, what have you. And so they're trying to make their way northward to safety. And so really, the squad that I've assembled for the game here is effectively the, the guard unit at the front of this column. They're following a road which is going to take them through one of the many medium-sized towns you find between Rangoon and the more mountainous region in central Burma. The Japanese, meanwhile, have been putting out their tentacles across all these roads and tracks, trying to trap as many British units as possible. Now, of course, the difficulty for the Japanese is their numbers were not uh, inexhaustible. And Burma's a big place. There was an awful lot of routes they had to try and guard. Uh, and of course, for the sake of mobility, some of the units they threw forward as blocking units were necessarily quite small. So the Japanese have put out a strong squad uh, reinforced with a bit of extra weaponry, but it's still only a, a fairly weak entity. And their orders are to get to this town before the fleeing British can block them in anticipation of the main Japanese forces who are coming up behind, trapping them and crushing them between a hammer and an anvil. So that's the backdrop to this scenario. I'm going to play it as a full three deck scenario in its duration. So this is, this is not going to be a situation where one side is already entrenched in the town. Uh, it's going to be a situation where both sides are actually trying to race for an advantageous position. 
I am going to use some of the jungle rules for this scenario, but as they're not fighting in virgin jungle, they're basically going to be fighting along a road uh, uh, which passes through a town, so there's going to be buildings involved. I won't be using the buildings cards as jungle cards. I'll be using the woods cards to represent light jungle. But I will apply the jungle rule modifier, which is that Firepower cards have their, their attack strength reduced by one in jungle conditions to represent the reduced visibility. So, before I start the game, I'm just going to quickly introduce the contending forces, because of course, like every nation in Upfront, they have their own unique national rules, which make them pretty interesting. And the British and the Japanese are both quite interesting. The main British national trait to remember is their emphasis on marksmanship. So British Army training for most units emphasised the importance of marksmanship. And in upfront, this is represented by infantry units being able to employ a firepower card at one less than its printed cost. So say a fire card requires a, a a collective firepower within a group of, say, 10. The British can fire it if they have nine firepower points. So that's the key British advantage. In terms of hand size, the British have five card hands. They can discard up to two cards if none of their groups perform any actions. And in terms of split cards, they're able to use um, US or German uh, um, sides of the split card. The Japanese, their national traits include a very tough squad. Most squads in upfront break if they suffer 50% casualties. The Japanese have to suffer at least 75% casualties before their squad will break. They have an ability to conduct banzai charges and these can be quite lethal at close ranges. It allows Japanese units to enter close combat without the need to infiltrate. And any group that performs a banzai charge, if it has any pinned members, they are automatically unpinned as if a rally card was played on them. The downside of this, as I've mentioned in one of my previous videos, is that Japanese troops attacking in this fa fashion are much more vulnerable to gunfire and they're more likely to be killed rather than pinned or wounded if they're conducting a banzai charge. Japanese squads have a four-card hand. They can discard up to two cards if they perform no other actions with their groups. However, there's a couple of important caveats to this. To reflect their exceptionally good field and soldierly craft, um, Japanese units playing a movement card in any capacity do not count as having taken an action for the purposes of discarding. Also, regardless of whether they discard or not, the Japanese can always discard scenario-defined cower cards. So any card that the scenario rules state is a cower card or any card that they cannot use anyway, like say a sniper card if they've lost two snipers in the game. Um, they can just discard them as long as they show their opponent the card being discarded so that they know that it's a legitimate, um, a legitimate discard. Now, just to point out, in this scenario, I'm going to be treating the pillbox and the minefield cards as scenario-defined cower cards. Uh, my rationale for this is that the town is merely a location that's being fought over. Neither side has had an opportunity to build a bunker in the middle of it. And the same goes for mining. Both, both armies' units are converging on this town, but nobody's been there to, to conceal mines or lay minefields or similar traps. So they're not going to be involved in the game. So before I start, we're just going to take a slightly more detailed look at the forces involved. Uh, as you can see, the British have somewhat fewer men than the Japanese, but they're not without their advantages. So they have the usual mix of rifles, submachine guns, and they have a Bren gun in the squad. 
I followed what I think is the fairly standard practice in the British Army at the time, which was to divide the squad roughly evenly into a manoeuvre group and a fire support group. This vehicle here, I ummed and ahed about whether to use this because the collection of armoured vehicles the British had in the Burma theatre were really quite an eclectic collection of armoured cars ranging from really inadequate vehicles dating back to the 20s and 30s all the way up to f a handful of fairly modern armoured cars. Unfortunately, up front doesn't include any of the particular models um, that I picked out from reading Louis Allen's um, exceptionally good book on, um, on Burma. So I slightly compromised uh, in using the Mark VI here. It, it's the closest thing I can find that ticks all the boxes. It's probably better armoured than something the British would normally have had. But it does only have a machine gun and its machine gun's firepower is not terrifically good. So I think it is a reasonable stand-in for the sort of thing the British would have been able to drag with them for this sort of exercise in the middle of March 1942. The Japanese squad is the standard 13-man squad, um, all of them riflemen except for one private with a light machine gun. However, they have been bolstered with an anti-tank rifle. Now this is probably not as good as it sounds because the, the Japanese anti-tank rifle, unfortunately, had the reputation entirely deserved of being the worst anti-tank rifle in the Second World War. Um, a few debatable ones were as bad, but I, I think it was probably the worst. And it was also the most difficult to handle. So in the game, not only does um, Private Oi over there need help from one of his mates to operate the gun, He's also unable to move it by himself. It takes two men to move the Japanese anti-tank rifle. And that's, that makes it a bit more of a curse than a blessing. Somewhat more potently, each Japanese squad section has a man equipped with anti-tank mines. Now, these can't easily be used in an offensive manner, not without exposing the carriers to a lot of British gunfire. But if you're overrun in a tank attack, then they could be used against your armoured vehicle to pretty lethal effect. So what they're doing is actually it's more of a deterrent. They're forcing the British armoured vehicle to stay at arm's length unless it really feel its commander really feels that a risk is justified. The Japanese, in terms of how they've distributed their squad, have also followed a fairly standard pattern. Uh, if you're going for fire and manoeuvre, they've actually, they've actually blended their weapons mix into the way the squad's organised and deployed for battle. So there's a group of five riflemen protecting the anti-tank rifle with one of them assisting. And there's another group of five riflemen clustered around the light machine gun. In the meantime, they have the usual um, early warning pair, I'll call them, out in front, just keeping an eye out. They're the scouting group. Now, in game terms, there's another reason for separating those two out. They have the lowest morale of all the men in the Japanese squad. And the reason they make natural scouts is because you don't want them getting pinned easily and restricting the maneuverability of your main squads. Um, for the British, I've chosen men with reasonably high morale. I wanted to represent one of the better units uh, in the British Army at the time. So they may well be from the 17th Indian Division, uh, which, which was, uh, although it got badly chewed up later at the Sitang Bridge, was one of the more capable units in the British Army in this theatre at this time. Victory conditions, the one thing I've not mentioned yet. I'm going to keep this fairly standard. Obviously, if one side breaks the other side's squad, that's a victory. Failing that, the side which has units in a more units in a further advanced position in terrain, which will give them cover, is the winner. 
If the battle is drawn under both those conditions by the end of deck three, then the Japanese win by default because they do have the slightly weaker force. And it's only fair to assume that even if they don't manage to block the town, at the end of deck three, if the British have failed to break through that blocking force, then the assumption is that elements of the Japanese 33rd Division have caught up with them and their column of trucks and refugees and swallowed them up. So time is not on the British side. They've got to break through. And so without any further ado, I've set up the squads and I've dealt the initial hands. So starting with the British, who are the attackers in this scenario, there's initial placement of terrain. So looking at their hands, the British have a gully. And this is a tricky one. They could start playing it on their own men, but a gully is not actually that helpful at this distance. And mm, it's a difficult one. They could place it on one of the Japanese squads. But then that gives them cover. Do the British really want to do that? The only benefit they have is that it restricts their field of vision. There is one thing they can do. They will attempt to play it on that group over there, because that's the group with the anti-tank rifle, and that's the group they want to mess up slightly, because at this distance, the anti-tank rifle is the one that can potentially cause harm by knocking out their tank fairly early. Well, I call it a tank, but really it's glorified armoured car. The Japanese have a much healthier initial hand. That is really looking quite good. They have options. So they are going to place the wall by their scouting group. The British have no cards they can play. And the Japanese are also going to give this group a hill because that gives them an early advantage in elevation. The British are going to pass again. The Japanese have no more terrain cards. I'm just going to move the camera around a bit so we can try and see everything. I hope that's clear. So having done that, both sides replenish their hands and play proceeds. Okay, the British now start with a concealed card and an awful lot of fire cards. Now everyone's at relative range zero, so British Group A is unable to shoot. British Group B has a Bren gun, which has a firepower of two at relative range zero. That's quite enticing, actually. He is going to fire off that card just to see if he can start by weakening some of the Japanese units. Now, he cannot see the unit in the gully to fire at them. He can see the unit behind the wall, but one wonders if it's worth um, doing anything with them. He can also see the group on the hill to fire at, but the British need to remember that the more shooting they do, the faster they deplete the decks. Is it worth the risk? After some deliberation, the British decide they're going to go for it. So the Bren gun opens fire at the group on the hill. Its firepower strength is one, reduced to zero, because I'm using that element of the jungle rules. The cover that the hill affords makes it a minus one. So this is not going to go well. So taking the base strength of minus one, I'm going to work across that Japanese group and open fire, starting with Okimoto, then Togo, then Yoruba, Kobayashi, Fujiyama, and then Asante. So, Sergeant. Uh, minus one and a zero is a miss. Minus one and a one looking consulting the random number here is a zero minus one and a two that's a one but his morale is four that does nothing for kobayashi oops a one again nothing fujiyama nothing 
And, ooh, golly, lucky it was a Bren and not a Japanese machine gun. That would have been a malfunction had it been so. Okay, so the Bren has tried to lay down some suppressive fire at quite a distance, and it's not really achieved anything. Now, at relative range zero, the armoured car has a fire strength of five. Now that's a bit of a pain because the uh, British have some dramatically powerful firing cards but realistically they're not going to be making use of them till later. Because we're only in the first of the three decks, it's going to take a chance and target the same group that the Bren gun did. So we're going to go through the same process. Um, same value of fire card as the other group, so we're looking at a minus one base strength. Six draws, and it's not looking good. No, no, and no. So, despite the armoured car spraying the hill with fire, the Japanese are completely unfazed by that attack. Uh, unable to do anything else, the British draw two cards to fill their hand again. So they got another firepower card and they got a hill, but not. this is not going to do them much good. They're going to have to manoeuvre closer, but I, I think they're understandably reluctant. That's quite a significantly large Japanese squad out there. So the Japanese, in the meantime, are considering their options. They are going to... The temptation is to get this group moving, to get them out of the gully. But then conversely, they're quite safe where they are. And, as, and if the British are, are thinking of rolling forward, that gully may actually prove quite useful. I'm, I'm doing my best to pretend that as I swap from one side to another, I don't know what's happening in the other side's hand of cards. So if I were a Japanese player ignorant of what's in the British hand, for now, I'd be tempted to leave the anti-tank rifle where it is. I'm happy with that squad's position on the hill. I might want to advance my scouting group to see if I can get a good position and discomfort the British. So I'm going to use my movement card and play it on them. Ordering an advance. So their relative range token is moved up to one. In the meantime, the light machine gun on the hill is going to do a bit of suppressive fire of its own, and it's going to target the British manoeuvring group. So we've got a firepower of two, minus one because we're in jungle conditions. Oh, plus, plus one because they're on a hill, so it's basically two. The British are going to counter by playing a minus two concealed card, so the base value of the Japanese is zero. So they've got four targets moving across from left to right. Private Tresham is not hit. Private Willis is not hit. Private Cottrell is most definitely not hit. And neither is Private Ross. So more cards have been burnt. So far no losses, but there's a fair amount of lead flying around. And that is going to end the Japanese turn. So they did engage in fire combat, so there's no discards. They're just going to draw to fill their hand up. Ah, uh, they seem to be getting all of these. Back to the British. They're in a little bit of a fix, really. The fact that that Japanese group of two men is advancing to relative range one is helpful because it means that British group A can target them with that card. And they decide that it's worth suppressing them. 
plus it means they don't burn through quite so much of the deck. So base firepower is three, reduced to two by the jungle. Back up to three because the Japanese are moving, but minus two because they still benefit from the wall. So British base fire is one. The Japanese are quite keen for them to come to no harm, so they're going to play that dramatically good concealed card, which means the British firepower value is now minus two. Ooh. Despite that, they almost worried Private Fujida, but not enough to bring him to a halt. Um, Private Fujita is barely aware he's even being fired at. So uh, that, that did not go quite so well for the British. There's not a lot they can do with the rest of their cards, so they're just going to hold on to those. And draw another two. The Japanese, now they're going to take a chance and carry on moving those two. But now that they've got another card, perhaps after all, it is time to start these things, the, this group moving. They're particularly keen to knock out the British armoured car if they can. So rescinding their previous thought, the Japanese decide they're going to begin a cautious advance down the gully. They still cannot fire at anyone, but neither can they be fired at. So it's a perfectly safe move to make, even though they've got uh, they've got nothing. Uh, 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 they, they've got no s sensible terrain cards to lay on them yet. Both groups are actually in a fairly decent position. And just for the sake of burning cards to discomfort the British, the group on the hill is going to entrench, or try to, for their action. They don't succeed. They need either a red or a black zero to entrench successfully. So that being that, the Japanese draw their cards. Back to the British. Hmm... This is not looking very good. Um, these cards will be amazing later on, but at the moment they're really not that helpful. But the British don't want to pass up an opportunity to fire on the Japanese. So again, this group on the left is going to target that Japanese pair over there. So effectively that's zero because of the jungle. Back up to one and then minus two for the wall, so it's minus one. The British open fire. Still to no avail. They haven't even kept the Japanese heads down. So unable to do anything else, they'll draw a card. Hmm. Okay, still no good options there. The Japanese, meanwhile, are pressing on. Now, rather annoyingly for them, they, they can't fire that card because only their LMG ha is generating any firepower and it's not generating enough. So there's not a lot going on there that they can do much with. Um, they can't discard that marsh onto any of the British groups because none of them are moving. And that's a cower card, which they don't really want. Um, remember, for split cards, the Japanese can only use... Ooh, for split cards, the Japanese can only use Russian cards. So that is a... Um, that's an open ground cower card. Hmm. Not ideal terrain, really. So the Japanese are simply going to discard those two. And see if they get something a bit better. Hmm, not really. The British are facing another quiet turn. They, It's a shame to let these go, but it's early in the game and they simply cannot use them. The British desperately need some options. So they're going to discard those two. Draw, oh dear. 
Not at all what we want. Where are these movement cards gone? The other side has got them all. Empire of Japan. Unfortunately, still in the same sort of situation, really. They're going to take a huge risk and discard the rally card and the fire card. Aha! Light jungle. More light jungle. Maybe there is something to do the uh, divinity of their emperor after all. They seem to be doing rather well. Um, the British are in, in slight despair over, <laughs> over their complete lack of options. Um, they're going to risk getting rid of the hill and the strength 15 firing card. They just cannot seem to keep it together today. Oh no, really? Really? Oh, back to square one. Something, some sort of terrible indecision is now gripping the British force. In the meantime, both moving Japanese groups get from their previous cover into light jungle. For the Japanese, everything is going according to plan at the moment and they are moving into a fairly advantageous position. Um, and yes, as the others have done something this turn, in the interest of wasting even more British time, the central group tried and failed to entrench. Japan's next cards, oh dear, more useful cards. The British really do not have many happy options. The Japanese are still too far away for them to, to use any of these firing cards. They can't get to these building cards, so they're just going to have to carry on chucking them because they need the movement cards to actually advance and take these places. Ah, uh, what? Oh, oh, finally, finally. I think we're moving, lads. Will it be in time, though? The Japanese are settling into their new positions and considering their options. Now, at relative range one, the Japanese decide they're going to play a hero card on Private Fuchida which doubles his firepower to two, and with Fujita backing up, they can take a shot or two at the British um, Group A. So firepower of one, reduced to zero by the jungle. So Private Tresham is not bothered. Private Willis is unconcerned. Remember, red ones are a negative, not a positive. Private Cottrell is frankly nonchalant, and F Private Ross is equally unbothered. So, yes, that was a bit of a waste of ammunition for Fujita and Fujita, but not a waste of time for them, because it has burnt more cards, and it's making the British position even more desperate than it was earlier. Um, the group on the hill will do nothing, but they'll attempt, other than attempt to entrench, still no joy. And the group on the right, now that they can see, they're going to attempt a shot against the tank. Because the anti-tank rifle functions like ordnance. So it's going, it can be fired by a firing card of any strength. And at relative range one, it has to draw a zero to hit, and it misses quite spectacularly. However, having fired once, it can turn the British counter to that side, reminding the Japanese that if they target the British tank again this turn, sorry, the camera's not really focusing, um, they get a plus one to their to hit frequency. 
if they aim at the tank again in the subsequent turn. So there's been a puff of smoke and uh, the British in the armoured car suddenly realise that they're now being targeted by an anti-tank rifle. The day just keeps getting better and better. Meanwhile, the Japanese drawing to refill their hand continue to get awesome cards. Good options. Over to the British. Come on, lads. We really could do with a break. Ordinarily, it would be tempting to give a movement order to the armoured car, if only to remove that and throw the aim of the Japanese anti-tank riflemen off. But I'm going to take a chance as the British. I think that at this distance, the chance of him doing more than, well, basically trying to hit a barn door, um, is small enough that I can advance one of my infantry groups. And I'm going to send my manoeuvre group forward because the British really, really need to get their men forward and they desperately need to get to a range where they can actually take advantage of, of their firepower skill, really. So the closer they get, obviously not too close because we don't want to risk a Japanese Banzai charge, but just a little bit closer so we can start pouring some effective fire on them. If they can get to those buildings at the outskirts of the town, that would be fantastic. The question is, are the Japanese going to let them? That group generates a firepower of six at this range. Still not enough to use that. And neither can the armoured car use it. So having, having conducted an action, the British regrettably cannot discard that card upon the Japanese. That is a shame for them because something that distracted the Japanese right now would be very useful. And they draw another super high firing card that they really don't have much hope of using this turn. The Japanese, considering their many, many options at the moment, Much as they enjoy having this hill, they've got a lot of firepower there that's not really being brought into play. And as their other groups have already advanced, it's probably time for the LMG section to catch up. So the Japanese are going to play that movement card on them. Get them moving. Still benefiting from the effects of the hill. And the... Hmm, difficult choice of targets. They could either, they could either fire the anti-tank rifle again, or they could target that group of moving British soldiers while they're vulnerable. They decide they're going to target the soldiers, so that the armoured car gets a reprieve, while the Japanese Group C shifts its attention to the now exposed British soldiers. So they have a firepower of two, reduced to one for jungle, back up to two because the British are moving. Hmm, this could get hairy. Nope, Private Tresham's all right. Ah, two plus one is three. And um, Willis's morale is three. Now checking the wound column. Oh wait, no, no, I lie. Willis has not been pinned yet. So Willis is pinned, unfortunately. He's still moving with the group, but once they get to some terrain, he won't budge. He's keeping his head down. He's just desperately looking for some cover. Meanwhile, oh no. Cottrell has been pinned as well. This is not going so well anymore. Wasn't really going well to start with, lads. And lastly, Private Ross. Oh, six plus two is an eight, a natural eight. Unless he ends up being wounded, Private Ross is dead, I think. Um, so I draw that. Consult the wound column, it's a seven. 
Had it matched his morale of three, he would have been wounded. But as it doesn't, Private Ross has been shot. The first casualty of the battle. So Private Ross dies. And in dying, he drops his machine gun. So I'm just going to find a little counter for his sten. And it's going to drop to the ground in the vicinity. Now, I very much doubt anyone's going to bother trying to pick it up or they're trying to duck the hail of fire that suddenly burst out on them, but you never know. So that has been a pretty successful turn for the Japanese. They're going to triumphantly draw their cards and see what the British are going to do about this lot. Well, the British breathe a huge sigh of relief that the Japanese did not um, discard any terrain on them. The surviving members of Group A are going to bundle gratefully into those buildings to get away from the maelstrom of bullets that have been zipping around them. Um, in so doing, they lose any opportunity to pick up the fallen um, machine pistol, but... Hey, who's worried about that when you're trying to save your life? <laughs> uh, the British hand is still pretty terrible, although at least they can use that rally card on them next turn. The tank can't do anything. Um, at relative range one to those Japanese groups, it still has insufficient firepower. Um, at relative range one... This group doesn't have enough firepower, so the Brits are really, really in a bad position. They'll draw a card. Um, that's not too bad. They can use the German concealed side, or they can use that as a cower card. I think they're better off using the German side, to be perfectly honest. Back to the Japanese. Okay. Difficult choices, really. That group is going to try to entrench where they are. They fail. It may sound a bit mad, but as a gully has obligingly come along, this Japanese group, the center group, is going to put themselves into it to obtain some temporary cover. They may be thinking, if the British squad weakens significantly, of either infiltrating close to the armoured vehicle or getting themselves close enough to throw in a banzai charge. It would be fun and dramatic for them. And at the end of the day, it's the way the Imperial Army likes to fight, give them the cold steel. And that will buy them at least a couple of turns where the British simply cannot fire at them. OK, they can't fire at the British, but... That group seems to be doing a fair job of keeping the British heads down anyway. And speaking of which, they're not going to let this massive firing card go to waste. Having pinned most of the British manoeuvre group, the anti-tank rifleman's now going to turn his attention back to the tank. And at this range, he needs to draw a zero to hit it. Which he does not do. That was a bit closer than his first shot. So that gives the British armoured vehicle something to worry about. Japanese replenish their hand. I think that anti-tank rifle will be shooting again over the next couple of turns. Now what of the British? They really need to do something. First of all, they're going to rally those two men in the buildings while Private Tresham keeps a lookout. Private Willis and Cottrell will sort themselves out. Still unable to do anything with these fellows. Ah, oh, annoying, annoying. So the British are just going to draw another card and hope for the best for the moment. The Japanese, yes, they will do some 
Rather unnecessary entrenching for that group, which fails, and same for the center group, which also fails. In the meantime, they'll expend one of these cards to let the anti-tank gunner fire again. He still needs to draw zero at this range. Nope, he's not doing it. Now he does have a rather difficult job, that anti-tank rifleman. Not only does that rating represent the difficulty in aiming and training his hugely cumbersome weapons, but the rather ineffective nature of Japanese anti-tank rounds are factored in. Mind you, if he does actually land a blow on that thing, he probably will have enough to punch through it. So we shall have to see, really. The Japanese, annoyingly, for for the British, not so much for them, have drawn a movement card they can use and a concealed card they can use. Those split cards can be devastating if you get the right ones. Back to the British. They are really not doing well in terms of options, so they are going to have to discard some cards because they really don't have much choice. They're going to get rid of one of the firepower cards, but they're also going to dump a wire card. <clears throat> so dropping a wire card on that Japanese group, if it's not moving, you can rationalise it as some off-map mortar fire or some distant support or something else that's occurring on the fringes of this action that's given them pause or is, an, is, is discomforting them somehow. Uh, whatever it is, it's going to provide the British, they hope, with a very short breather. And drawing their new cards, they pray, pray for better days. Uh, no. Still hopeless without the movement cards to... I mean, good terrain, really good terrain. Where are the movement cards? Why don't we just advance? No. No one's feeling up to this cumulative effect of too many defeats over the last few months. It's taken all the motivation away. The Japanese look at their hand and find that there's not actually that much they need to do except that they can do more entrenching attempts for their groups, because again, they, ooh, their centre group has done it. So despite the fact that they're generally quite safe from gunfire, unless the British get themselves onto a hill, the Japanese centre group is now entrenched. Now the group on the right has a bit of a tough choice to make. They can, they can fire that card you, to use their uh, anti-tank rifle again. If they do that, it's at a penalty from the wire card. They could alternatively use that movement card to get rid of the wire card, but then they lose the to hit frequency advantage. So it's either or, really. I think in the spirit of aggressiveness that the Imperial Army was wont to show, I'm going to opt for firing the anti-tank rifle before dealing with the problem of the wire card, so they're going to do it. Still need a zero, which they didn't get. And that concludes their turn. Hmm, dubiously useful. Of course, they don't know this, but the British aren't going anywhere soon. Back to the British, oh. So difficult. Why is it always so difficult? The British are going to discard one of the concealed cards and the woods card. And not for the first time, hope that they get something they can make use of. Finally! 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 Oh, thought we'd never see one of those. Hopefully we can do something useful with it. Um, the Japanese, they're going to make an entrench entrenchment attempt, those two over there, and they succeed. 
Mm. The digging in bug is clearly catching. And that group over there is simply going to play the movement card to get rid of the British wire card. So whatever minor distraction turned up was obviously very minor because it hasn't held them for very long. And the Japanese get a movement card. Oh dear. That superb mobility of theirs is definitely showing in this game. Right, so I realise it it's gone on um, for a while, uh, so I'm going to stop the video here. I will do a follow-up where we play more of the scenario and we see what happens. But just to sum up, at the moment things are looking very good for the Japanese and somewhat less good for the British. They have not advanced um, their fire support base or their armoured vehicle. They have managed to push their manoeuvre group forward into the buildings and the outskirts of the town they're trying to get. So, so the force that's meant to hold the road open is beginning to get there, but it's already cost them a man. Very nearly cost them another two. They were lucky to get in there. And the Japanese know full well where they are. The Japanese, in the meantime, are pressing forward very steadily under good terrain, um, their weapons have been pretty effective so far and the men have clearly shown that they know their business. So it's not starting off well for the British, but it is far from over. And in the next video, we'll see how the situation develops. In the meantime, I hope that this has been an interesting scenario. As always, I welcome any comments on what you think. Um, any tactical advice you want to shout in my direction for either side or just place bets on who you think is going to come tops on this. But in any case, thank you very much for tuning in and thank you for watching. Goodbye.